Pan Am Talk without Rob Mario. I am Mike Hornby, and I'm joined by the regular Friday gruesome foursome, Mr. Mr. Stubblefield, two-star. How are you doing, Bill? Doing very well. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for asking me. A little badge of Mr. Height. Good morning. Good morning. Best-selling New York Times author, John Gilstrap. Welcome. Good morning. I was... I was a little nervous I was going to get an animal, but I didn't, I'll, just, I'll just say uh, best-selling author. That's Not nice. quite. And, of course, uh, Mr. Larry Schultz. How are you, Larry? Great to be here. How was Doing the drive? Good. Pardon me? How was the drive? Um... Not too bad. Not, Not too, too bad. bad. The traffic through Hedges was getting better? It's getting better. They finally finished that diversion around the one bridge. And I noticed you've got a very high-class uh, roundabout down the road here at Peace. Uh -huh. uh, and I'll go through that every time I come. So it's great. Uh, I do like the roundabouts. I do, too. I mean, I was first on a roundabout 45 years ago or so mm -hmm. uh, in Abu Dhabi. Oh. And I thought, what the hell is this? You know, country it, boy from just, Pennsylvania. It's a traffic circle. They <laughs> yeah. didn't have traffic yeah. circles in Pennsylvania? <laughs> now, the cabbie we were with was a little angry. Let's just put it that way. Screaming at the guy next to him that he was, had no lane <laughs> discipline. But we got through it. And joining us by phone is Joe Ferretti. Joe, can you get us? We had a little technical uh, issue there. Uh, yes, I, I can hear you great, and I, I can see that Colin is getting things straightened out. But <laughs> this is going to be a week where Colin has to be pretty nimble. I will yeah. get better and better every day. Now, folks, uh, Rob is off all next week, so uh, we have a blend of uh, myriad of guests that uh, I think you'll find very uh, interesting. Uh, it'll be fun. Technically, we will be terrible, but <laughs> content-wise, we'll be great. Adventures and feedback and dead air. <laughs> <laughs> we will have a lot of fun, and luckily I don't report to anybody but Kresha, so uh, we can make these mistakes and we'll just have a great journey. It'll be an interesting time for um, hearing doctors and audiologists because people will be saying, I'm listening to the radio, but there's nothing. Right? I'm going deaf. <laughs> <laughs> Little boom -lit for those folks. So, Joe, why don't you start us off with topic number one? Well, I'll be glad to, Mike. Thank you. I, we haven't really kicked this around much on the on the Friday Five. Uh, we were off last week, of course, due to the holiday. So I thought we would get into this situation with our current sitting president, Joe Biden. Uh, we all are very familiar with, uh, of course, what's happening and, and whether or not uh, he's going to continue in this race, which is the central question. Uh, the NATO summit just uh, completed in, in Washington, D.C., and of course that was a, a bit of a test for the president to see how he was going to do, particularly the one-hour press conference he held last night, uh, so we might have some thoughts on that. Uh, overall, I think this is a question uh, that is going to uh, have to be resolved here in the next week or two, because time's running short in terms of the, uh, the campaign that must Commence and, and, of course, with the uh, conventions coming up, the Republican conventions next week. So uh, I, I guess the question we're going to have to kick around this morning is where do we see this going? Uh, my thinking is that the Democrats are facing a tantalizing prospect of a splash and dash nominating process where I think there would be pretty significant media coverage. I think there would be some enthusiasm for the process. It's something new and different. And and this much we know. In the current matchup between Trump and Biden, the most popular choice is someone else. And if the Democrats are able to perhaps pull a rabbit out of a hat here and get someone else on the ticket, the question is, is, is that going to be something that the public latches on to? And is that going to cause the kind of excitement and enthusiasm that, frankly, a Trump-Biden race is really lacking? So is this an opportunity for the Democrats to do something new and different and, and change the course of this race? Or are there too many pitfalls in taking a sitting president and asking him to step aside and let someone else take the reins. I, I, clearly, there are some, some hurdles <laughs> with that venture, but is it something that the Democrats really have to consider 
seriously going forward here, given the trajectory of the current race. So that's that's the question I wanted to throw out there this morning. Two star. Yeah, uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, this has so many moving parts. Uh, if you look, when we look back upon it in history, it's going to be one of the more interesting, more and more dynamic times in the history. Last night's performance, I think, did not really satisfy either any either side. Uh, they were looking for Biden to fall flat on his face so it'd be easy to convince him to get out. Or they were looking for him to do such a superb job to say the debate was just a uh, flash in the pan. Uh, as it turned out, he did neither. It was a, uh, a reasonable performance, but it was not enough of a performance to convince anyone to change their mind one way or the other. Uh, the Republicans, I think, are, uh, even though not said, the timing of this is not good for the Republicans. It's taken away from the spotlight that you generally get with a convention. Uh, up to this point in time, in previous years, all the attention be given to the upcoming Republican convention. That's not the case now. Everything has been directed toward President Biden. Uh, Will he be able to survive this? Uh, I don't think so. I think that uh, he's gotten so much attention now. There's so many skeptics that are raising their head. So I, I, I'd be very surprised if he's the candidate in the fall. Uh, now, what does this do for the selection process? Uh, something this is new grounds we have not been on. It could be very fairly set. Uh, uh, President Biden could step down. All fingers would be pointed toward Kamala Harris. Uh, and that would be probably the safest way to go. Or there could be a mini convention before the convention with uh, four or five candidates. Uh, and it's, uh, I think uh, you can look at it wringing your hands and say, Man, woe is us, woe is us. The other way is what an interesting time we're engaged in right now. John Gilstrap. <clears throat> I Interesting times indeed. Um, Biden is such damaged goods now, and he's been kneecapped by his own party. The uh, This drumbeat of day after day, day to day, is he going to drool on himself or is he going to come up with, with a, a cogent thought? I think it's fundamentally damaging to the, to him as a candidate. I think it's damaging to the Democratic Party, which I, I lose no sleep over. Um, but I also think it endangers the country to a certain degree because you know, the debate has been so much. The, the drumbeat in the news is all about, is he the right candidate? Is he the right candidate? Nobody's asking the question. You know, he's working from 10 to 4 when he's cogent. So, you know, the North Koreans are... Well, we can we can only attack. It's almost four o'clock. We have to attack before four, right? So, there used to be there was a commercial got I don't know ages ago about you know to the phone call at two in the morning. Who do you want to be president? That's that's a that's the driving question that I should think we should be asking. Um, I don't know how they get if 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 Biden doesn't want to let go of the, the, the presidency for the nomination, I don't think there's a way to get, get rid of him when the convention happens, uh, other than the 25th Amendment, right? If we're going to call him an incompetent president, incompetent in the, in the mental state of, of incompetent, um, there's the mechanism to get rid of him that way. But if he doesn't, if he doesn't give it up, I, I think he's, he's the guy to, to go all the way through, which as as a Republican, I would love, I think he's the ideal candidate. And we haven't heard much from Trump. Why would we hear much from Trump? Why would we hear anything from the Republican parties when the Republican Party, when the Democrats are immolating themselves in this in this total meltdown? I think the convention starts next week, the Republican. Yep. So that will suck all the oxygen out of the room, and that will give Biden a breather for at least a week. Larry? Um, yeah, I don't. Um, believe that Joe Biden's ability uh, to manage crises in our government is really uh, at any risk. And the reason I say that is NATO's as strong as it's ever been. Our economy is the strongest economy in the world and it ain't even close. We have the lowest unemployment in my lifetime. Um, inflation is now coming down. The inflation caused when certain folks didn't do a thing about COVID when they could have, instead of just telling us that it was going to be over in 15 days, there were things the federal government Don't could have done more quickly. 
Huh? Don't forget about the bleach in the earth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I lay awake at night sometimes, and it always strikes me as funny that we worry about the mental fitness. Also, Larry, if I can, the crime rate is down as well. Oh, yes. Yeah. Very voluminously down. Um, didn't go down under Trump, went up. Came down under Biden. So I'm not worried. The presidency is an institution. Yes, it's one guy. But he has a giant staff. One of the ways we know that is Trump's former staff members and appointees are all over Project 2025. But we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I'm not worried that Joe Biden's not going to be fit to do this. And if it turns out he's not fit to do it, I think he will tell us. And uh, last night, I thought he was impressive with his facts. You right. could, he stripped over a few words, but he came, he knew the facts on a lot of fronts. Yeah, they weren't true, but he yeah. knew them. <laughs> over to you, Mr. Uh, Height. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. We, we talk about his performance last night, and it, and it was better in some regards. Uh, than he has been, especially during the debate. Um, but uh, his facts weren't facts. You want to give uh, me an they, example? They were half truths. Want to give me an or, example? Or, well, some of the things he said about Trump and and the chronological events and 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 how they came along and and calling uh, Trump his vice president. Those things he he stepped on. He had gaffes. He had a lot of different things like that that were. Uh, a, a lot like he has been for a while now. Come and, on, uh, be, and, be and more specific, it, Mike. That's uh, those are kind of throwaway statements he did there, but you got to be specific. Uh, okay, so uh, he he talked about the economy. Uh, the the inflation was higher. Um, was at like nine percent when he took office. Not true. Not even close to true. There were things like that. And and, and there were many. Now some of the things he said were true, and, and I'll give him that. But not always. And, and what it comes down to is his own party is, is bailing on him right now. Not, not Larry. Larry thinks he's doing a fine job. All right, I'll concede that. There is but, a bedwetter caucus. There's but, no question. Okay, right. So, but you have you have the people, the elites in Hollywood who are jumping ship. You have people in, in Congress on the Democratic side that are jumping ship and are calling for him to, to step down. But he was the Democratic nominee. The people's choice have chosen Joe Biden to lead them. And now you have the elites that are, are asking him to step down and put somebody else in there because polling is not going the way that they want. Well, that, that's not how our democracy is, is, uh, is, is, is rooted. We, we ask the people through elections and primaries who do you want to lead your party? And they have chosen Joe Biden. Now, for all of those now that are, are turning their backs on him be, because he's not making sense or he's no, not coherent, or they have not been paying attention for the past two years. Shame on them. Because this is the same man today that he was last year and the year before. There, there have been these gaffes and these mistakes all along. Now, maybe not in year one of his presidency, but certainly in year two and year three. It's He's been like this been for a, a while. But, oh, but Mike, but his gaffes have been going back uh, ever since he's been in public out. Uh, no, public I'm talking eye. about his coherent. When he speaks, whether it's during the debate, everybody talks about the debate he had. Well, he's been that guy all along. And, and for Democrats to deny it now and say all of a sudden now he needs to step down, they haven't been paying attention or they've been watching MSNBC too much. They cover up and don't show the gaffes all the time. I, and if this may be a point that John Gilstrap may get into on his issues. I, I think he was shielded. I think we were we as a nation were masked. He may have been deteriorating. I don't think it was that obvious to us, uh, uh, Mike. So the well, fact what you, know, you should have put on Fox News a little more. You, we've been seeing this for. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you should try yeah, it. Watch again. MSNBC yeah. and CNN. You're right. They yeah. do cover up. They don't show yeah. all those those issues that he's been having for years. Fox does. You're right. Fox is biased to the right. There's no doubt about it. But if you watch it. He's been doing these things for quite some time now. And to Larry, um, I mean, 
I know you say the economy's in the best shape, and we're, 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 but when you go to the grocery store and you go to the gas station, that's what people see, and they're they're seeing inflation, where you're right. paying three to four times more than what we did three years ago. Oh, there's right? no question that one of the things that a second Biden administration needs to do is reawaken the Federal Trade Commission and begin to go after the price fixers in gas, food, medical care, because it's going on. You don't find, um, you don't find real competition. Drive around Martinsburg and look at the price of gas. Drive around Martinsburg and look at the price uh, at Martins and Food Lion, which are both owned by the same conglomerate, Giant Foods. They are fixing prices. And so when there is a reason for inflation, and COVID was a reason why you were probably going to get some, then they take total advantage of it. And nobody's going after them for fixing these prices. You know, back I, in the day, I, don't, I used to do, do that. Do not think anybody is fixing prices in the Eastern Pan on gas. That is just un, completely untrue. When's the last time you saw a price war on gas here? You it happens every what? day. 7-Eleven Seven, yeah. in Shepherdstown yeah. versus ro Rocks. Ro Royal, Farm, Royal Farms cheaper. versus Wawa. There's, there's, they're always competitive, and it's based on what they pay, too. So I understand. You, you have to understand. It's not like it was based in the, on the 70s market. and 80s, though. You're, you're right about that. But people used to go from one to another for a penny difference. You know, it's not like that anymore. It could right. be... It could be... That one across the street can be five cents more expensive. People... Just don't care. I'm not going to drive across the street for five cents. Right. So let's get back to Joe. Joe, you want to wrap this up? Well, I, I, looking at this, uh, look, I, I, I hate to do this because I'm not friends with these folks, but to, to defend the elites that, that everybody's uh, talking about wanting Biden out, uh, you know, the elites weren't responsible for his performance in the debate a couple weeks ago. Uh, that That is an image and that was a, a presentation that a lot of us cannot unsee and it happened and now but Joe, don't you think they over prepared him and he just couldn't comprehend all of that information? yeah uh, yeah I, I could guess at that mike uh, i have no idea what was going on behind the scenes and whether they had over prepped him or they over uh, extended him in terms of his preparation time and, and the energy it took to do i, I have no idea uh he, but Regardless, whether it's him or his handlers, that was a major screw up and a major problem that a lot of folks can't unsee. And when we're talking about elites, uh, the polling I've seen is over half the Democrats being polled right now think he should step aside. Uh, so there's been a sea change here, a shift in, in how the electorate is looking at him. And so we, I think it's only natural to see a, a lot of people coming forward, whether they're elite or whether they're from Hollywood or whether they're a sitting congressperson. Uh, they're coming forward and saying, hey, we might need somebody else. The trajectory of this race is not good. Uh, they see the polling. They know that in the battle states now, Trump is starting to surge ahead. That's bad news. So there's a lot of thinking that, you know, things need to change. So I... I I, that has a certain appeal to a lot of folks right now. And while I believe it's messy, I believe it's a debate and, a, and a, an examination that has to take place. Look, the biggest concern I have, and, and I, I, I don't see this talked about enough, is when we vote for somebody for president, we vote for them to hold that office for four years. Is there anybody here who thinks that President Biden is going to be able to do the job three and a half or four years from but now? Who did you vote for, Joe? Uh who did, who did, who did I you vote, vote for? for in the primary? Uh, I, I didn't vote in the primary. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> uh, the uh, I'm in Georgia. <laughs> and, but Georgia and, uh, had a primary, right? Yeah, Georgia had a primary. I did not vote. Uh, I didn't have a, a an opportunity to vote. Actually, I was in West Virginia when we had yeah. our Georgia primary. If, if you had, um, well, if, if, oh, I, I, I would have voted. Let's see who was on the ballot. Biden. I, I, I probably would have voted for Biden because he was the only one on the ballot. So, so if you voted for him, then 
surely you would have thought you want to have but that, that, that representation but that what I'm saying for is four that's, years. That's before we saw this debate performance. And, and yes, I agree with the sentiment that I think he was shielded. I think this has been choreographed now for uh, the better part of a year. Keeping it, He hasn't done a press conference in, in over a year until this one yesterday. So why is that? I think the Democrats um, have, have been hoist by their own petard here in, in their entire uh, strategy in this campaign seems to have been let's hurt Donald Trump. Let's, it, between the lawfare and, and, you know, convicted felon and all of this, surely nobody is going to vote for Donald Trump. So they, they shield Biden and they put all of, all of the eggs, pardon the, the, the cliche, put all their eggs in the, in the Biden basket. And they found out that First of all, Trump is Teflon. He fights back really hard. And um, now they've got these damaged goods. And they wouldn't, uh, I don't know how party politics works exactly uh, at the Democrat level, but certainly nobody came at Biden to, to challenge him for the nomination because it was, it was his. He was anointed the, the, the king. I don't think yeah. if, if, if Biden were, were not trailing in the polls and if he had a, per, a, a uh, popularity rating that was above 32 34 percent whatever whatever it is now we wouldn't see the democrats lining up and saying we need to just because he can't complete sentences the the reaction to the the debate would be i think it's hard to prove the negative but the reaction to the debate if biden were ahead in the polls would be oh he's fine don't worry about it it's only because you, you can't unring the bell and people are saying, "Oh wow, look, look, look at that shell of a of a once good guy." It's it's the confluence of what you what they see with the bad polling. But they're one they're they're related, John. They're related. The bad polling was a direct consequence of what we saw with the debate. And that's exactly what they were fighting so hard for anybody to see. I don't know who on the president's staff. Maybe you don't get that vote. What moron? decided that they should have that debate this early. And, and who decided that? It, it, seems it seems very choreographed to me, like Joe says. that, that This was on purpose. They, they've seen this happen. They're like, hey, we need to switch gears. Let me go back to a point that uh, John Gilstrap made, and that was nobody running in the primary against Biden. This is typically the case for incumbent president. Rarely do they have primary challenge. So we sure. did not have a challenge with, with Trump in 20. We did not have one for Obama with, between his terms. So it's very common not to have But challenges. if the staff was aware of his infirmity and they were yeah. covering for him, the loyal thing for the country yeah. would have been to let's, let's find a new candidate. I think we're all agreeing with that, John. This, Nobody, I'm not challenged. And this is why Joe Manchin should have run as a Democrat Absolutely. against Joe Biden. Which is but, what I said but, all along. And yeah, Joe Manchin he would be their candidate. goes against him as a Democrat. Right mm -hmm. now, Joe Manchin would be your nominee because there would have been a debate much like there was with Trump, and Joe Manchin would have annihilated him and shown all these deficiencies early on before the primary, and Joe Manchin could have been the nominee right now but, and could and could be well ahead of Trump in the polls. But Joe Manchin could not pass the litmus test of the, the party faithfuls, uh, which is much more progressive than what Manchin is. One same, debate. Same Bill. thing with... It's all he needed. Well, but no, <laughs> but he, Manchin is not, is not acceptable to the progressives in the party, just as moderates are not uh, acceptable to the Republicans on the, the, the far right. We're Plus driven he's not by a Democrat the extremes. Anymore. Well, he's not, but he, he was at that point. He yeah, was a Democrat, yeah. and he could have run on the Democratic ticket. He's and you're right about the progressives. However, once they had that debate and the progressives saw the, what Joe Biden is right now, I think they would have changed tune because a Joe Manchin as president is still better than a Donald Trump as president in their eyes. Yeah. Well, Joe, and, 60 and seconds to wrap it up. Yeah. You guys are this, it's raising another issue, which uh, I think is very apparent. The weakness of the political parties, uh, both sides, uh, is very apparent here. This is how we end up with two candidates who nobody wants. Uh, you know, there, there should have been a process on each side. The Republicans basically ceded the ground to the Trump people, and they, they, he just waltzed through the primary. Nikki Haley had no chance. And on the Democratic side, there was no primary. There was no challenger. 
Uh, and and this, if, uh, this election cycle cried out for a real challenge to the, the uh, presumed incumbents in, in, in this race, and uh, we didn't get it. And I, I, I put that at the feet of the political parties. They're just so weak. Thank you, Joe. This part section of our program brought to you by Orsini's Appliance Store, or not just an appliance store anymore, uh, Orsini's.com. And welcome back to Eastern Panhandle Talk with Mike Hornby, Bill Stubblefield, Larry Schultz, John Gilstrap, Mike Height, and Joe Ferretti. Joe, you with us still? I still am. No, oh, that's good. I hit the right button. <laughs> <laughs> need to adjust your camera. For one. <laughs> hey, one, one out of two, so one out of three. Bad, bad in 300. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move right along. Uh, Two-star, what do you got for us? Yeah, let's shift to the state politics. Uh, several weeks ago, Joe Manchin said that he would he would not run, be running for governor, uh, but he put a caveat on and said, provided Steve Williams can raise enough money, and he kind of left it open-ended. Well, money came out this past week of how much folks have raised. Uh, Marcy has raised over $5 million uh, since last year, raised $2 million in the second quarter alone. He has a million dollars on hand, plus he has the backing of Black Bear Pack, which has a lot of money, which he used it in the, in the primary. This is contrasted with Steve Williams, uh, the governor, uh, the, the mayor of Huntington, who has $52,000 on hand and has raised only $46,000 in the second quarter. The, the fellow that really needs statewide visibility, you get that through money and money alone, and he has no money. So my question is, will we see full circle? Will Joe Manchin come back and said, I gave Steve Williams an opportunity to raise money to make a viable campaign. He was unable to raise money. Will this change the dynamics of the race for governor? Joe Ferretti. Well, we know Joe Manchin is sitting on approximately $10 million. So the money's there if he wanted to do something like that, Bill. I don't know if he'll do it if the polling doesn't uh, give him a real shot at winning. And in a state that is Trump plus 28, I don't know how you could expect polling to show that even Joe Manchin has a shot at winning uh, and, and returning to the governor's mansion. Uh, so I, I just don't, I mean, look, Joe was himself, though he, he looks very good for his age. I mean, he's in his mid-70s, and uh, you have to wonder uh, how long he wants to keep at this. I, I, he clearly has a desire to stay relevant, but uh, I don't know if he has a desire to, uh, to get beaten in, a, in the last election he'll probably ever run. So uh, it's a tough calculation. I don't see him doing it, though, in the end. And uh, I think Morrissey's march to the governor's mansion is inevitable. And if Shelley or uh, Jim Justice ever give up the Senate seat that they're going to have after this year, uh, I think Morrissey will end up where he always wanted to be, and that's in the U.S. Senate. Mr. Height. Yeah, I have to agree with Joe's assessment. Um, <clears throat> Joe Manchin has placed himself in the perfect position to do this uh if the polling pans out. And I think that is exactly what he's waiting to see, is if uh, as, as things progress towards November, um, does the polling see him having a shot? And I don't think he has to have uh, polling that shows him ahead. I think it has to show that he has a shot and that that the polling shows right now that Morrissey's got a, a pretty significant lead over Steve Williams. Um, but when you start throwing Manchin in the mix, how does that, does he take enough votes away from Steve Williams and from Morrissey to make himself uh, a viable candidate? And if the polling starts to show that, and I think you probably have to have to start seeing that within the next month but if it starts showing within the next month that he is a viable candidate if he gets within i don't know five points six points 
of Morrissey, he may jump in the, the race. He has set himself up for this. He, he, he changed parties the day before, he, you know, it was mandatory to do this. Uh, he has the money. Um, all the, everything's there for him to do this. I think he's waiting on the polling. Larry? Yeah, the, the thing that interests me, um, arithmetic was never my uh, uh, favorite subject, but he only needs 33.4% of the vote if he gets in the race. He doesn't need to get a majority, right? He's just got to get more votes than the other two guys. Well, that's not necessarily true. Um, because he could get 33% and and Morrissey could get 40% and Steve could get next to nothing. Yeah, I suppose that's I suppose that's right too, but um, he doesn't need 50% to win this. That's correct. And because, you know, and there's at least a chance that Williams will say, all right, Manchin's in there, I'm out. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. But uh, he could. In any event, Manchin's not having to sit there and consider this, saying, can I get 50.1% of the vote? He didn't have to. Um, there is a much smaller number that he would need to get. Now, agreed, if Williams doesn't get any votes, then he's got to get 50%, but Williams will get some votes. He's done a great job as a mayor of Huntington. Wasn't he the mayor? Yes, yes. still is. Yes. And still I mean, is the mayor. They, they got pounded by the opioid crisis in the state with the highest rate of opioid overdose death in the nation per capita. He really, you know, they recovered um, a lot. And so it'll be interesting. Didn't Joe um, get elected in a Trump year? I mean, didn't he win a majority of Trump voters? Isn't Joe probably the second most popular politician no, in, I think in it was 2018 that so that was uh, uh, the midterms of Mid-term. Trump's administration but Trump was in power right and Trump had already won that's, yeah. overwhelmingly that's in West right. Virginia that's right exactly yeah. and Joe overwhelmingly won a popular vote in a Republican state mm-hmm. yeah. John <clears throat> I, I I don't know um, I, I think we kind of have to listen to what Joe Manchin has said, which is no, he's, he's not going to run. So um, it, I can't imagine that a man who has had the success that he has had um, wants to end his political career on rolling the dice on, on an election that he may very well lose. He's, he, he ran as, he seemed like to me, and I'm a relative newcomer to the state, but he seemed like a pretty moderate Democrat. And then with the Green New Deal vote, he kind of, he alienated the Democrats by holding out for as long as he did. And then he alienated the Republicans by finally voting in in favor of the Green New Deal. I don't know that you're going to find um, a, a, a lot of undecideds who are going to uh, going to go vote for the independent. As my favorite admiral in the world once told me, the vast majority of people vote from the right side of the ballot. You know, you, you see the letter. It's an R or a D. And there's just not a lot of folks that are going to go out there and vote for an I. All right, well, let's move on. Let me ask that. I, I realized going through the discussion, I'd asked the wrong question. The wrong the question should have been, will Steve Williams get out? But uh, no. the, we, can go around the, we can go around. Do you think no. Steve Williams will no. get out? No, He's, yeah. he is the nominee for the Democratic Party. He will stay yeah. in. Larry? Um, I don't think he will. I also think that Manchin's decision is this. Do I want to run for governor and potentially lose my last political race? Yeah. Or do I want to just take that $10 million and go home? <laughs> Joe, <laughs> Joe, do you think uh, Steve will, will bow out? No, I think he'll stick in even though he's not viable. He's got $50,000 in the bank. And and, <laughs> and Morrissey has almost uh, a million in the bank, $2 million raised in the last quarter. Uh, it's... Uh, Boy, you, it's not a fair fight. Do you think that if uh, Steve had $10 million in the bank, he could actually beat Marcy? I, I, well, I, I think more people would know about him. I mean, I don't know how you campaign across the state with $50,000. I, I had a political consultant tell me one time not long ago that at a minimum, to run a statewide campaign, you need $250,000. Uh, That's he, he what has, they were spending in the Senate races. 
Oh, more than that. Yeah, right. <laughs> he, he, has a, he has a fifth. I'm talking about so the state I, Senate. I, yeah. yeah. So where, why isn't the money there in this case? Where's the Democratic Party? Would you donate money if you thought you were going to get pummeled 70% to 30%? Well, isn't that the way it, it works? Don't you? Would, don't the Democrats want to have a running shot at... at I think they have to pick their races. They have okay. to pick their... The, the statewide races are are very tough for them right now. I think they have to go into the legislature and the uh, the, the state Senate and, and try and win some of those races. And, and that's where you've seen a lot of money being raised for Democrats. I, I think you're right, Mike. I, I, that's a good point. The, the Democrats... Uh, <laughs> such as, as things are here in West Virginia, they have to pick their races and, and invest their money wisely. So they, they do look at, at certain legislative races and certain seats in the legislature that they know uh, could possibly have influence over public policy going forward. So they, that's, that's where their energies are now. All right, let's move on to the next topic. We're going to go with uh, Mr. Schultz. Yes. Now that Trump's clear connection to Project 2025 has become obvious, <laughs> he denies knowing anything about it. Is anyone surprised? <laughs> Let's start um, with Mr. Height. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just because they were his advisors does not mean that he was behind the whole Project 2025. And even if he was, I, I, I have not read Project 2025 from front to back. It's 900 but, pages. Right, <laughs> exactly. But what I have read, the summaries and everything, I don't have a problem with that. The the Democratic uh, people have had... Machine. Ha, have had the, yeah, the Democratic <laughs> machine have had these types of things for, for years. It's about time that the Republicans sort of, or the conservatives, I should say, got on board and, and started trying to push their agenda with with the candidates that they want. There, I see nothing wrong with Project 2025, and if, if Trump is distancing himself from it, I don't know why. He should be embracing it, and, and if nothing else, looking at the things that are in, in clear contrast to his stance in 2025 and just pointing them out and say, I agree with Project 2025, except for this and this and this. Well, he does need to tell us the parts that are ridiculous and abysmal. Right. That's his, and he said his that, terminology. Uh -huh. And he needs to tell us what they are. Because... What is you know, your objection to Project 2025? Well, I have not read it either. I just didn't have time to read 900 pages. Um in recent days, but things like um, taking away uh, no-fault divorce is one of the things they've talked about. I'm not sure that that's laid out there very clearly, but there are a number of things destroying the civil service in the federal government. That's a disaster. That is a nightmare, having Trump appoint every single person uh, who might audit your taxes. Because um, they're not going to audit his. God knows nobody <laughs> wants to take that on. Uh, maybe you could get the guy who's, who's uh, whoever it is who's gone after Jim Justice this many times, and he could train up uh, to, be, <laughs> to, to do the audit of Trump. But um, there's a whole bunch of different things. I that have are several listed to, where you want to go. And, and speaking of that, there's Bill Noah. Is gone. Noah's gone, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why would Noah be gone? Is that one of their objectives? That's one of the objectives. Get okay. rid of Noah. Well, yeah. then you're probably against that for sure then. Well, right, we'll get, look what we'll get rid of. Right. You'll get rid of the weather service. You'll get rid of all the uh, the monitoring the weather. The The local radio stations do not come up with their with the data. They depend upon Noah. The National Fishery Service, uh, which uh, controls uh, so we do not overfish a certain fish. Uh, the uh, satellite service. There's a uh, the climate change research. A lot of stuff is going to be that's uh, that is. But Trump said done. a lot of this stuff was ridiculous, and he distanced himself, that, right? Well, he needs to tell us which things it's are ridiculous. It's 900 pages, if I may. Yeah. Yeah. Let me. Let okay. me. There's some others as well. Uh, he would see. Uh, he would impeach. Calling for the impeachment of all the judges whose decision he's disagreed with. Uh, he's. Uh, he's. But why? Why would he do it? 
if well, he's saying part he's this, not part, part of this. part of 2025 right. uh, to impeach the judges. Uh, appoint conservative district attorneys to prosecute all the political enemies, something we've never done in this country. Uh, to get, as someone has said, get rid of the civil service and fill them in with, uh, uh, with political appointees. Uh, uh, seize direct control of independent agencies such as the FBI, Federal Trade Commission. Uh, dismantle any seasonal immig agricultural immigration coming in the country. There's a lot of things in here that would be highly disruptive to the government that we know today. John? Okay. There's the QAnon version of yeah. what Project 2025 is, and this is the version from the BBC, British okay. Broadcasting Company, have, have less involved. Uh, Project 2025, 20, it, it's, it's four main um, policy aims. is to restore the family as a centerpiece of American life, to dismantle the administrative state, I'll get to that in a second, to defend the nation's sovereignty and borders, and to secure God-given individual rights and to live freely. That's what Project 2025 is. Sounds like the American dream. horrible. Yeah. Right. So, as far as the government is concerned, yes, there's a lot of drain the swamp in, in, the, in the goals here. And that is to, right now, I think we can all agree that we pick the agency you don't like. Uh, there are a lot of, of workers, government workers, who are really unaccountable to the political leadership. And they're all executive branch uh, uh, operations. So there should be, I would think, some level deeper level of direct control over government employees. And you have to understand this is not an all or nothing thing. This is this is kind of a a, a, a roadmap. As far as immigration, the the highlights are exactly what you would think. It's um, Im improvements or dismantling the Department of Homeland Security and combining it with other immigration enforcement units and build the wall. That's no surprises there. Climate and the economy. Uh, stop the war on oil and natural gas and lean into the skid of what America is good at and and. Um, and, and th there's more of an emphasis on tariffs. It's, it's a reworking of, of the economy. And then it gets into, here's where I think um, Trump is probably worried, uh, the abortion business. You know, um, doesn't call for a nationwide abortion ban, but it does propose uh, abandoning the, the pill I can't pronounce, <laughs> that one. Um, Not impressed, though. Yeah. And, and then there's, you know, eliminating pornography, you know, that's going to be banned, uh, school choice. So there's a lot of elements within this Project 2025 that likely would never get, it, get through the courts. But it's, it's, it's still a roadmap and a game plan for bringing con conservative viewpoints. In, it, it's a 180-day plan for how to fix, how to right the ship that, that the conservatives think. It's almost impossible to get half of that done in 180 days. Of course Joe? it is. But where this is well, actually coming from is when Trump took office in 2016, he was unprepared. Uh, he did not have the right. people in place. So what 2020, Project 2025 is doing is to correct that possibility. So he would come in with people in place, a philosophy, an idea. And so the quibble, which side... Which, which ox has been gored, uh, I'm sure that John Gilstrap and I could view the values of this totally different, and that's fair. Right. Uh, but there's, uh, there's some risk, I think, to the government that we see today. Joe? Well, I, I, I'm going to admit I'm, I'm a little less concerned than perhaps others about this Project 2025. It is a brainchild of the Heritage Foundation, which going back to at least the Reagan administration, has been attempting to steer Republican administrations in terms of public policy. In fact, I read up on this. In Reagan's first cabinet meeting, he brought in a Heritage Foundation publication and threw it on the desk and told everybody to read it. Uh, so th this is not new. It's, it's something that's been around for quite a while. Now, some of the specifics of Project 2025 from the Heritage Foundation are very problematic. As Larry pointed out, getting rid of the civil service system in terms of these federal agencies would be a disaster. Uh, the Pendleton Act has been in place since 1883. And the Pendleton Act is basically the civil service uh, system for federal employees. That act was passed over 140 years ago because a, a 
person who served in the, in the administration of President Garfield, I believe, uh, was miffed because he didn't get a promotion because he was actually paying bribes to get a promotion, and he shot the president. So Congress said, hey, we better do something about this political patronage that surrounds all these, these administrative agencies and these people who get jobs. So they passed the Pendleton Act. It has been a law that's been followed and upheld forever. And this group now, the Heritage Foundation, wants to do away with that. And they want to go back to the days where you paid for your federal jobs, or if you knew the president or were friends with somebody, that's how you got a job. That leads to incompetence, that leads to graft, and it leads to a nightmare. So those are, I hope, some of the things that, that Trump's looking at and, and calling abysmal and, and unworkable, because certainly that's one of them. You know, I think it's unfair to introduce legal and historical stuff into a group like this. You know, it, kind of, it just sort of derails free-form conversation. We actually have facts that we have to deal with. This really annoys me, Joe. I just want you to know. But I learned something new today. The, um, the <laughs> I do want to hear Mr. Trump's uh, list. But why, why, why are abysmal. you assuming that this is Trump's plan? Because I mean, he said it, he said it. of his appointees are listed, and, and there's the also 400 the other conservative authors. organizations. Yeah, that are but on the, it. the ones that wrote it, the 35 people that wrote it, 30 of the 35 were served in his cabinet or is his uh, uh, well, close advisor. Almost advisors. every conservative served in his cabinet because he fired most of them. I mean, he went, he <laughs> well, turned over the ones that were not fired. <laughs> <laughs> these are the ones that lasted. Is that what you're saying? Lasted, yeah. And then advised them on a bad campaign, and he lost. One, one of the other problems with getting rid of the civil service is something like this. Suppose a senior person at the State Department uh, takes the newly immunized President Trump um, aside and says, Hey, I'm hearing rumors that you're going to get paid a billion dollars by Elon Musk to make him the ambassador to China. And that he's going to do it, and then you'll get the money afterward, and they'll just treat it as a gratuity or a tip. Um, I want there to be somebody in the civil service of this nation who says, I don't care who you are. I voted for you, but this ain't happening. Larry, there's over a million employees come in the federal government. You really think the White House is going to be appointing over a million jobs one, by, one at a time? Well, no. I don't know, but the civil service protections allow that senior de uh, State Department official to go to the media and say, hey, he's selling the ambassadorship to China. I know he's immune, so we can't charge him with a crime. We got to stop him some other way. Unless you work but, for the IRS and you want to talk about Hunter Biden. But I, I think Project 2025 is just like any other document that comes out. Some of it's good. Some of it's preposterous. You take what's good and you run with it, and you leave all the other crap where. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm you, not can confident that you, you can compare you that I with or what me we and Trump would agree on. What's I, the sense of the budget and policy of West Virginia? That's just, they have their own way of thinking. They, everybody, AFP, all these, are, they all put out the stuff, but it, it doesn't mean that. Every legislator or president or whoever is going to follow this law by letter by letter by letter. You're, you're right, Mike, but there are some of the tenants in here that are very disturbing, such as impeaching the judges who you disagree with. And he said, did he not, that some of the stuff is ridiculous. And he, well, he distanced himself from that. He shouldn't have to well, answer for something that, that, that he fact. did not create himself. Well, he distanced himself from the whole thing. So he I did. Don't, I don't know anything about it. And that's where it's called in the question that's because all of his people line. that wrote this, all the people <laughs> that wrote it, were directly associated and with And do you think they're telling him what to do? You yes. think anybody's telling yes. Trump what to do? No, yeah, I do not. Heritage found it, no. They're part of the swamp. He's the one that's been against the swamp all along. He's, he's the one that's it's sort of gone rogue against the elites, even in the Republican Party. What's the elites? We've been throwing that word out. Well, so well, we, I, we don't have time to get into that, but we'll <laughs> come back right after this break. <laughs> the elites are the the gill straps and the stubble fields that live on the Potomac. Uh, you have to drive through an, a, a, a pearly gate to get I to them. Senator Hornsby. Thanks, Mike. How you doing? Good. How you doing? <laughs> part of my show brought to you I don't, I don't even know what I'm talking about <laughs> um, That's a good 
Orsini's Appliances, we'll just give them a plug. Orsini's.com. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Eastern Panhandle Talk with Mike Hornby and the gruesome foursome and Joe Ferretti on the phone. Um, I hope you're having as much fun as we are. Um, it's pretty interesting in here over the break, but I forget. We're a live stream. <laughs> yes. Just people can see now that it would be different. We should just uh, turn the, the audio off and just put the cameras on, and you can see the, the yelling and screaming that goes on at each other when, a, when it's turned off. All right, we're moving right along to the bunny rabbit, the badger, the Sarge, Mr. Hyde. All right, I'm going to go back to Biden, and I think Biden is the best chance for a red wave and not just at the top of the ticket but down ticket as well i think that if biden remains on the ticket and the, the nominee for president that there are going to be a lot of democrats that just don't show up that that they don't see the point and how will that affect down ballot um, for the Republicans. So I think there could be a red wave uh, that we didn't see two years ago um, in this particular election. So my question is, if, if that's the case, why are so many Republicans calling for him to step down? It just doesn't seem to make sense when it's in their benefit for him to stay in. Let's go to Joe Ferretti on the phone since he's a Republican. <laughs> well, one of, one of the things. That, <laughs> oh, oh by, by the way, I always thought uh, the elites in our area lived off of a, a this avenue called Street of Dreams. But uh, <laughs> I, dig, I, dig, I digress. Um, <laughs> I am a champion of conservatism. Did you not see the news last night, Joe? <laughs> no, that's a different guy, Senator Hornsby. <laughs> yeah, that, they changed that. It's got changed by this morning. I lost Go all ahead, respect Sarah. for Alex. <laughs> Uh, Mike, I, you, you raise an interesting question. Why are some? I think some Republicans truly believe that the, that the president's not up for the job now, and, and maybe that's part of why they're they're asking that he step aside because there's a fear that uh, he's not capable of uh, serving as president given his performance at, at the debate a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but you're right. Politically, it makes little sense because. Uh, I have to believe that the Trump folks want to run against Biden now uh, and see him as diminished in, in many ways, politically and perhaps otherwise. So uh, that's the person they want to run against. I'm sure they've geared up their entire campaign to run against him. Uh, some of those ads are already in the can and ready to go. So uh, you got to believe that that's who they want. Uh, the down ballot races are an interesting dynamic because a polling I've seen shows that that uh, folks like uh, Senator Tester out there in Montana, whose seat is, is up, uh, the senator in Ohio, whose name escapes me, uh, oh, Sheldon uh, uh, Brown, I think his name is, uh, He's they're polling ahead of the president. Uh, so uh, that that is a bit of an anchor. Uh, and I'm sure those folks, uh, as is Senator Casey in Pennsylvania, they're worried about uh, the effect of having Biden at the top of the ticket. And uh, don't be surprised if a few of them don't step out and say, hey, uh, we need to make a change. I think more of that's developing. But, yeah, the dynamics of the, of the down ballot races are interesting. And uh, uh, I think part of this process in terms of whether or not Biden's going to remain on the ticket. John. The presidency is is not a ball game. You know, we're actually kind of in charge of the free world. And maybe the patriotic thing to do is is to look at a frail guy who obviously, I don't know how if his brain is working well, but the connection between his brain and his mouth clearly is not. And there is a frailty to him. There's a frailty to his movements. And perhaps the patriotic thing to do is to say, hey, Mr. President, it's you got to go. You're just not up to the job. Now, having said that, put patriotism aside, politically, they're out of their minds to be asking Biden to step down. You know, my, my inner politician, the degree that it is a ball game in my heart, I love to go Biden all the way. To be, because what he does is he actually runs cover for Trump, who doesn't have to say anything. 
He always gets in his own way. Trump runs his mouth and he says something bad and he runs the news cycle. Biden will always run the news cycle as long as he's doing what he does. Bill? Yeah, I think the fear of a red wave, Mike, is the reason that so many Democrats are nervous now after the debate. And that's why they're putting put as much pressure as they can because... It was mentioned earlier that uh, uh, Biden has to step down. Otherwise, the Democrats more or less have a hands tied. But they are putting pressure on him to step down. And I think it's because of the down ballot nervousness of the Democrats. And going back to your question, why are the Republicans pushing to, uh, uh, to get Biden removed? I have no idea because Trump is polling behind the other candidates right now. He's even with Biden, but he's, uh, he's actually, Trump is behind uh, Harris. So uh, the, yeah, and, there's no and reason. Real clear politics been. polls? No, I'm, I, admittedly, I have one, one recent poll, but I've not seen the consortium of the I'll just say, Real Clear Politics okay. has him ahead of every candidate. Is that the same Real Clear Politics that predicted a 22 red wave? Yes. Uh, and and they were but, dead wrong. But Real Clear Politics takes all uh, know, polls yeah, and combines yeah. them together. The one I'm talking about, Mike, was a very recent poll in the last two, couple of so days. Okay. Yeah. They? Um, yeah. Uh, the... Um, the thing that most concerns me about Biden is this, uh, as I've referred to it, the Bedwetter Caucus. Um, it, you know, it's fine to have concerns, but a guy like John Tester, he's either going to keep the votes necessary to win in a conservative red state like Montana, or he's not. It's not going to depend on who the president's presidential candidate is. That's just not how that's going to work. They know him in Montana. He lost some of his fingers farming. I mean, he's a pretty basic salt-of-the-earth guy. Um, I'm kind of sorry that he's wasting his time going out to, you know, um, cry into his and clutch his pearls in front of the whole nation because that could cause Montanans to say, the hell is wrong with you? Get out. Um, I mean, he's, a, he's an anomaly anyway. See, I think Republicans should be focusing on their convention next week, and they should be focused on who Trump is going to pick as the VP, because I think that's a extremely important uh, thing, and I just haven't heard anything. Well, you haven't, but I think Bill brings up a good point, is, is why, why would you if you're a Republican, why would you come out and, and, and promote all these things when Biden is the one running the news cycles right now and it's all negative? So if it's all negative, you don't need positive reinforcement on the Republican side. You just need to sit back. Trump, keep your mouth shut. Sit back and allow but our convention Biden to is do the damage week that they're doing. But I mean, it's irrelevant. We, it, you can wait till the day We have to it. generate excitement. We've got to get to the polls. If you want to beat somebody <laughs> and you want to beat the machine, you need to generate the excitement to get to the But you don't to have to polls. do that a week before. the. You can do it during the convention. Right. Actually, that's, it's a reason to true. watch the convention. When was the last Absolutely. time we had a reason to watch a convention? No, and yeah. hopefully they'll announce at the convention, right? Uh, I'm Does he have to? Yeah. Does Does that have part to? Yeah, that's the... Well, that's the ticket, isn't it? But that, I think that's what he says. Don't they there. vote on the ticket? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So he'll have them all out on stage and he'll eliminate them one by one. They'll fall through the <laughs> stage. Whack You're fine. Like whack them all. The reverse of The Apprentice, yeah. <laughs> That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> all right, Mike, you want to follow up on anything on that? No, no, no. no, We're good? All right, we're going to uh, Mr. Gilstrap. Do we right. have Joe for ready to comment? I can't remember. Did you? On my I think Joe did, yep. Okay. Yeah, I did. Okay. It was so memorable, Joe. That was the. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> hey, Joe, I was looking out for you, and then John Gilstrap shot us both in the back. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to laugh at that, John. <laughs> as far as you know. <laughs> All right, I, I want to talk about the media involvement in everything that's going on in, in the White House right now. Uh, just and you're talking mainstream media, not mainstream, local media. Mainstream media, yes. want to make sure yes, we're. Yes, not, okay. not local. Um, actually, I think, well, it, it's a different discussion. I think people learn a lot. We have better discussions here than what you hear in a lot of the, the mainstream places. But we recently had George Stephanopoulos was stopped on the street and asked by, never talked to anybody, I guess, a TMZ 
guy said, what do you think about uh, Biden? And he said he can't do another four years. So Stephanopoulos had to go walk the, the, the shame walk and apologize and all of this. We've heard from the New York Times and from the New Yorker and from a number of big outlets that they have not been reporting on the obvious decline that they have observed in Joe Biden because it went against the drumbeat of what the papers were trying to do, which is to keep Trump out of office. Anything that makes Biden look bad inures to Trump's benefit. So rather than report the truth, they just keep quiet. And now that when it's coming up, there's the, oh, my goodness, we've been lied to. And they haven't been lied to. They've been lying to us. So my question is, shouldn't there be some kind of a consequence? we got some lawyers in the room, one in the room and, and, and one in, on the phone. The fourth estate has, has very particular protections in what they can say about people and do, protect against libel and slander in, in particular. They're supposed to be objective. And since they're choosing not to be objective and since they're choosing their targets, shouldn't, perhaps they need to lose that protection and when they get a fact wrong be held accountable for it because what we're doing now is just it it's it we're lying to the, the the government and the media is lying to the american people and as i've said on this show probably every week that i've been on this show government is an idea and the idea is all about trust and once the people stop losing trust in their government and in the media that's supposed to be holding the government accountable, we got nothing left. There has to, I think there has to be some kind of consequence. I throw this out to the table. Well, let's go to the lawyer in the room to start with, Larry. Sure. Uh, the New York Times, uh, very recently, uh, this editorial page, wrote an editorial uh, asking Biden to step down. I know, but they've also and been it, aware of this for, and well, not been reporting. I'm, that's what they have I'm reported. I'm not positive that not about reporting. that, um, but they, it's not their job, I don't believe, um, to tell people stuff about private meetings they weren't at. I mean, it, it gets a little dicey if you're a reporter and some Stephanopoulos or somebody tells you, oh, well, he did this and this. Okay, well, I kind of have to have some evidence, not just your word for it. And uh, that evidence was not available. On the night of the debate, it became available. Um, and so they had some evidence. I mean, George Clooney did a fundraiser, raised $30 million from, what, a month ago? Two, uh, three, four, weeks. three weeks ago? And yeah. now suddenly he's changed his mind in yeah, three well, weeks? Yeah, you know, George Clooney isn't... He's writing for the New York genius. Times. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's a friend you know. of Iraq. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, uh, that he doesn't impress me very much, even as an actor, let alone as a political commentator. But the thing about the New York Times is, when did they write a, a thing saying Donald Trump should get out of the race? He's got 34 felony convictions. He in just had to get immunized. In 2016, the editorial board agreed <laughs> that there was no need to be fair in reporting on Trump. <laughs> that he was so bad, they, they've actually moved the anti-Trump editorials to the front page above the fold and announced that they were doing that because he was such an existential threat to the country. So when you have, my point is, when you have these papers of record, their words, supposed to be objective, and they're clearly not objective, and then they are concealing, they're confessing, the New York Times reporters actually were reporting that they were concealing uh, this this data. I, I, I know a lot of people... We're supposed to make a point on the news, but... I, <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. I know a lot of people on, um, on uh, uh, my side of this issue, if we'll call it that, who have canceled their New York Times subscription. So hopefully, the free market will take care of any problems there. They appear you to have. You canceled it because they went against Biden? Yeah. Okay. I want to see the editorials demanding that Donald Trump drop out of the race. And they haven't written them. Because the people elected him as the Republicans have elected him. We, we, we saw all that. Okay, then still elected the Democrats him. elected so, Joe Biden, so... And, they, and, and, and that's who they should... But, I agree. To, jo to John's point, to John's point, the, the media has been covering up and not reporting. And there you say, maybe it's because they didn't know, and that's just not true. That if Fox News knows about it, and Fox News has been reporting about it for two years, and showing all the gaffes, and showing all these issues, then all these other news outlets have known about it as well. Which is why, as biased as Fox News is, it's why you have to have a Fox News. Because you have all these stations, and, and all these media 
outlets and at least here they admit their that, entertainment that are right right but they're over <laughs> they're over. they were forced to admit that <laughs> well they were calling you know, themselves some of, some some of it is judge some of it is and <laughs> some of it's not it's the same thing with with msnbc and mm -hmm. cnn some of it is is entertainment and and it's opinionated and some of it is news but the, the fact of the matter is these papers that John's talking about, these news outlets that John's talking about, have been covering for these problems for years now. Fox News has been reporting them for years. Look, this is what we have as a president. He's not fit for office. And now all of a sudden... The ones that have been covering up for years are coming out and saying, well, we didn't know. Right. It's shock. Oh, my gosh. In this debate, this guy I'm who's shocked incompetent, by, it's according been, to Fox. He has been incompetent. Joe Biden has been incompetent for over and two years now. Hang on, let, uh, hang on let's, get, let's, let's let Joe chirp in here. Okay. He, he, Go ahead. He, he, you guys going back and forth, Joe. Well, Tell them well, how they're all wrong. Well, <laughs> well to, to John Gilstrap's uh, query whether or not there should be some sort of, of criminal sanction or civil liability because a news organization failed to report something, boy, that's, that's pretty much striking at the heart of the First Amendment and would destroy an independent media. If we're going to hold them to the standard that you have to report everything that you see or speculate about, it has to be out there and reported, uh, and it has to be factual, uh, I think it just has to be verified and factual, right? That, well, that's there, there's, there's, there's a reason news organizations and newspapers have editorial boards and, and print editorials. They're opinion. Uh, they, they, they're, they're proposals. They're, they're you know, things that they'd like to see happen. Um, and, and, and that gets us thinking about these things and, and, and allows, it adds to the debate that we all engage in. Uh, I, I think what happened, though, Joe, is... You're not getting two sides of the debate on the national level on these uh, major outlets. Um, no, but you are. Fox News is a major outlet. In fact, it's the most popular news outlet. It is because television. their shows like The Five and, and, and things, they have both sides talking. It is predominantly um, conservative. However, if you go on MSNBC or CNN, you don't have a Republican or a true conservative <laughs> talking for... I think you do, Mike. I think you do. If you watch those, you find someone and you tell a me Stuart, a conservative. Stuart, somebody. Right. Of, yeah, they, they represent. Yeah, Maybe I, not to just say all. all Republican each. Congress. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have seen on some of these shows, you have somebody like a Chris Christie will sit in. And so it's predominantly liberal. And then you have a Chris Christie is there. If you look at the view, they always have a, a, a Republican or a conservative that, that goes against, which isn't any different than the five on Fox News that has four Republicans or conservatives and one Democrat. So it, it's the same thing. And and I would disagree with you, Mike, because I would say for, for every New York Times, you have a New York Post. And for every Washington Post, you have a Washington Times. So there are contrasts in there. What I'm trying to say is, and I think what John's trying to say is, the the liberal media, the liberal media has been covering for Joe Biden for years now. They, and now they're aghast when they see this last debate. Oh, my gosh, we had no idea how bad this was. Yes, you did. You you refused to cover it. And now the people that that read your your papers or or watch CNN or MSNBC. Now, they didn't know about it because you didn't report it. Mike, we all see what we want to see and we hear what we want to hear. I, I do not have the same sense that you have that the press has been intentionally misleading or ignoring. I think a lot what of What about their circling, office? Circling the no. wagon. I think the, the White House is the one that should be condemned for circling the wagon and protecting uh, the uh, the president from from being critically reviewed or or examined. And I, I just want to state for the record, uh, if if <laughs> I am not in favor of sanctioning, you, you taking legal sanctions against reporters who don't yeah. report something. I'm not suggesting punishing the negative. What I'm <laughs> suggesting is re-examining the the special uh, privileges that the media has when they can print stories that are utterly wrong, Russia hoax as an example, and 
and beat it and beat it and beat it knowing that it's deliberately false and still be protected because they've got their unnamed sources that turn out not so here's but to be real I, it's not, I don't want anybody punished I just think we need to hold them accountable for telling the truth but then that's that's is a pretty severe indictment against our media it is uh, and I don't I don't think that's the case I think these folks are trying to do a very legitimate job there's some bias to be sure they're biased on both sides of the fence but I think a lot of them are good investigative reporters but don't we've not mentioned NPR for example which I think attempts to provide an, a balanced view BBC attempts to provide a balanced view so it's not BBC's all. out of Britain they're not our media yeah, BBC America yeah. Well, they're still out of Britain. Yeah, yeah. No, no. But, but here's the thing, Bill. Don't you think it's the media that has made us so polarized against each other? You can't be, if you're not far, far right, you're... you're I, I think that you're yeah. far, far left. I, I, they, they've I, divided us yeah, to I the think, point where... I think part of the media is, falls in that category. I think the MSNBCs yeah. and the, the Fox News. But there's a lot of our media that attempts to take a more balanced uh, viewpoint. That, but uh, you view that only through your own perspective. You may not like right. what they're saying. Therefore, by definition, they're biased against you. So like back in the day, who was that gentleman that did the Walter Cronkite would, yeah. would do the news, right? And... He'd give you the news. He wouldn't give you his opinion on the news. He'd give you the news. That was that's what news was. We, and in the media, we've changed into giving our opinions. And now we're now we're doing these. Uh, it's more entertainment. It's all about trying to get the ratings. But my code a second. We have the Walter Cronkite still on the evening news that does not have the opinion pieces. Uh, David Muir, for example, on uh, ABC uh, and the others, you have 30 minutes of just the news being reported. Exactly the same thing what Walter Cronkite said. Now you have another sector of so-called news, such as the opinion pieces by Fox, MSNBC, and others, but we still have the Walter Cronkite. Where, where, do, you, where do you rank 60 minutes? In, 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 I mean, is that investigative journalism? Is that what that's called? I think so. Yeah. Okay. They rarely get Who, their Who's opinion. the best newscaster? National newscaster, most well known. I'm sorry? Who's the most well known national newscaster? Colin McLaughlin. Colin McLaughlin. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, wait, is it Lester Holt? Is he, is that, I mean, yeah, is that I, the epitome of, of, of the newscaster? Yeah, yeah, he and David Muir and folks like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to take our last break and then we'll come back for um, the last thoughts.